has to do with the ways in which the Internet is affecting this equation of trying to see ourselves both as a single global community with shared responsibilities and as multiple communities coexisting peacefully with lots of different mores and sort of choices as to which community to become a part of and what it means to be part of one. At the base of it all, I see sort of a single question shining, one that is worth years of study and experimentation. I see it as Gandhi's question, as Lincoln's question at Gettysburg. It's a question we ask ourselves whenever we start something new and it goes beyond joyfully the parameters we think uh, that we started with. And that question is, are we capable of governing ourselves? Are we capable of seeing the limits that we might need in a community where differences arise as coming from that community rather than from some external arbitrary force, the nanny that comes in and just sets things right? I think in the Internet zone, there are roughly three stories that we tell of these technologies and the impact they're making. Story number one is the cyber utopian. They're bringing everybody together. Now that you can email between Nigeria and anywhere, why, you can make all sorts of offers, tenders of deals that people might want to engage in. Another story is that we are making people more isolated. They're huddling with the screen, glowing on their faces, somewhere in the world of Warcraft or something called Second Life. If they were losers before, they're far worse off now. <laughs> it makes them ornery, twitchy, and not able to be properly socialized. That's story number two. Story number three is, yes, but get those people together and it even gets worse. The internet can cultivate <laughs> extremism because it can find that handful of people that are up to no good and bind them together where, as we know from criminal law, conspiracy is itself a leveraging force that can make trouble where just one lone troublemaker could not. And maybe, uh, I might call this story 3.5, there's a meme around that says, I don't even recognize my kids anymore. They're doing something with some device. They don't even have to huddle in their room to do it anymore. It might just be a watch or an iPod or something. They're tweaking or Facebooking or flickering or orchiding, and who knows what trouble they're up to, but I don't even recognize my own kids. So among these caricatures, I hope we can start to flesh out some of the subtleties that come and to start us off, the people at the table at first blush, if you think we're going to talk about community and participatory and bottom-up, it might seem strange to have a table that's basically five bosses and three teachers. But I think this is a well-selected group because when we start to see just who these bosses and teachers are, why, there's Craig Newmark, the Craig of Craigslist, the guy that started a mailing list just sort of for fun and the mailing list that grew and grew until it's bringing many newspapers to its needs because the free ads that you can get on Craigslist are cheaper than the non-free ads that you might get through a regular newspaper. Craig is fond of billing himself not just as the founder of Craigslist but as a chief customer service representative and one of the sacrifices he's making to be here today is that he's not able to be on his sidekick or Blackberry or whatever his little object of choice is Oh, he's actually on it right now. <laughs> it just goes to show you there's some problem cooking in the world of Craigslist that Craig is on top of. If, if you want to speak, by the way, anybody service that when I last checked in with Flickr in June of 2007, you had 500 million photographs. How many do you have now, Stuart? A uh, little bit over 3 billion. A little bit over 3 billion photographs. So you're catching up, perhaps you're going to pass Facebook? Yeah. Well, uh, Facebook's <laughs> Facebook well, we're going to approach the number of people. One photograph per person. If somebody were to come up to you and say, I've got a great idea, why don't you take your most personal holiday photographs and put them online for everyone to see and tag them while you're at it so that people searching for them can find them more easily, I'm not sure that would be a winning proposition. And yet? And yet it was. And actually, there's a good story of, a, of uh, someone who went to Hawaii, they very end of their vacation and lost her camera. Uh, was able to reconstruct her whole vacation for a I actually have read that blog, yeah. and it turns out that some Canadians found her uh, camera yeah. in this national park in Hawaii. She started the I Lost My Camera and I Don't Know Where It Is blog. <laughs> Eventually, through the blog and the collective action of those who tracked it, they found the camera, 
and she found the Canadians who then refused to return the camera because their son had gotten really into it. Then a little bit of pressure from the online vigilantes and the family relented. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's a good topic for them. A cautionary tale. Yeah. Yes. We also have with us Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, known within Wikipedia, the free online encyclopedia that anyone can edit, as at times it's God King, <coughs> at other times an utter irrelevancy. <laughs> if Jimmy were to take up yachting and without any Wi-Fi, for the next five years, it's entirely possible that Wikipedia would continue on as it's going. In other ways, though, when there's a certain dispute in Wikipedia, Jimmy can step in and say, democracy, great, but here's the answer, this is how it's going to be, and I'll get back to work. So a fascinating blend that perhaps I've now misrepresented to an extent that Jimmy wants to say a little something himself. Now that's kind of sort of melodramatic, but kind of accurate. Um, it, it actually, when, when you were talking earlier about this question of are we capable of governing ourselves and the question of uh, can communities online govern themselves in a proper fashion and we're actually growing through that process and the idea is to evolve community institutions so that I'm not necessary. Uh, and it's going reasonably well, but yes, occasionally. Actually what happens these days is I I normally only have to do anything active in a smaller community. So I help out with the uh, Wikiversity project. Last week I actually helped them ban someone because they were all at a loss of what to do. And I said, oh, it's actually very simple. You ban him. And they said, oh dear, really? Can we do that? And I said, no, you don't have to. I will. Um, But now they're they're talking about, what. okay, well, why would we do that? And when would we do that? And what what kind of due process do we want and things like this? Because it was the right decision in this case. And so I believe that communities can govern themselves, but it takes, it doesn't happen by magic. It doesn't just, you don't just throw up a web server with some software where people can socialize and they magically do the right thing. It takes a lot of human coaching, which is a lot of what the issue was. What was the issue? Um, The guy was just a flaming jerk and uh, (laughs) doing good work as well. That's always the hard one. If people are vandalizing Wikipedia, that's actually easy, right? You just, the community understands immediately to block what ha- the, the really tough community issues are the borderline cases. Somebody who some people like them and they seem to be sincere, sort of sometimes, and they're doing some good work, and they've never had to ban anybody before in a small community. So it's six or eight people, and, and they've been working together very well. And then there's this one guy, and some of them like him, and some of them don't. And then uh, you know the classic internet troll technique is to turn the good people against each other. And that's one of the real problems. Here. Is lawyering a good word or a bad word in the Wikipedia? It's mostly a bad word. Yeah. The idea, when, when we talk about people uh, wiki lawyering, uh, it's, it's basically, the communities tend to write down rules, but they really think of them as common sense, uh, more, more uh, descriptive than prescriptive. In other words, this is the way we see things, and this is the way we normally do things. And then somebody can find uh, a loophole in the law so to speak, um, which is mostly about being extremely annoying, right? And so exactly what we teach people. <laughs> <Harvard Oscar>. <laughs> <laughs> and so they they'll say, well, the rule doesn't say I can't do this. The rule says this and that. And then somebody says, okay, that's fine. We'll just change the rule. And then they say, well, what's the rule for changing the rule? And get into these huge long meta debates. And and finally somebody steps back and says, basically, you're being a jerk. That's the problem. And we are very sorry that we didn't write it down. Uh, in all the, you, you can't detail all the possible ways people might. Uh, you don't want a police state on the one hand, where you do any little thing wrong and you get blocked. Uh, on the other hand, you you don't want uh, complete chaos, right? And so, I mean, I would I would imagine at Flickr, for example, right? The Flickr users in general would go ballistic if if people started getting banned from Flickr just because they're complaining about a new feature, for example. Like, that would be ridiculous. You, you can't do that to people. On the other hand, the users would also be very upset if Flickr didn't come in and ban some people for doing certain kinds of really annoying things and sort of doing things that, that uh, disrupt what other people are trying to do and things like that. And so achieving that balance is very, uh, it's very complex, but it's actually, in my mind, it's no different from the kind of balance that we're looking to try to achieve with a good municipal police force. Yes. Uh, there are all these same kinds of 
complex questions of, uh, we want little old ladies to be able to walk uh, in Central Park safely. Uh, at the same time, we don't want the, the cops hassling everybody for ID as you yeah. walk down the street. And, and where do you draw the line in the middle? It can be very complex. Yes. Of course, here the cops are drawn from among the park goers. Everybody is potentially in a position to... But that's true in New York City. Most of the cops live here. Yes. And uh, they also vote. Yes. And, you know, so it, in, a, in a broader sense, there's nothing all that particularly unique about that. Yes. So there's lots here to go off of. Let's bookmark this how to maintain community discussion and continue our uh, introductions to get everybody into the conversation. Among the rest of our bosses here, we have uh, Martin Versovsky, who is a serial entrepreneur, founded a number of companies, uh, including Jazztel in Spain, but perhaps, and correct me if I'm wrong, Martin, most notable for the kind of conversation we're having here today is a company you founded called Phone, F-O-N, which allows people to take an internet connection, a broadband connection that they might have at their house or their business, hook up one of your little devices to it, a white box. And with the white box hooked up, their connection is now shared with the world. And when the world encounters it, they see a little screen, often that has you on it, that says, if you, member of the world, have your own white box, welcome, it's reciprocity time, and you can use my internet connection, and if I should ever be in Iceland or Ghana or wherever you are, I'll use yours. Or you can configure your box so that if the person doesn't have a box, they can simply pay three euros or something, get a day's worth of access, the money gets split between the person who has the box and Phone Inc. Um, fascinating idea with a totally uncertain legal landscape. I think some internet service providers were holding seminars called Phone, colon, Threat or Menace. <laughs> and um, Martin simply persisted. More phone boxes got out there. More phone narrows were coined. Build very much as a community, not simply a business transaction. And as I understand it now, a number of internet service providers have decided that phone might be a friend and have gotten themselves in on the deal. And if I sign up for broadband, I can now, from my broadband provider, become a Fonero. Am I missing anything there? No, no, no. That's a great description. Uh, we should have you actually tell a phone story at Fon. <laughs> you do a great job. No, uh, yeah, when we started, people thought we were like the peer-to-peer -peer of the telco business and we were saying that we were a telco built by the people. But then in the end, when we ended up giving up with companies like British Telecom, who's now a phone shareholder, um, or made deals with Time Warner Cable. Uh, so now we have actually Time Warner and Google, for example. We have Google as a shareholder. And uh, things that in the net neutrality debate where where uh, nobody thought it would be possible to get the carriers uh, and the content companies together. But we, we've done it because in the end, we're all in this together. So. Uh, phone grows uh, actually better in the rest of the world than the United States, and we're going to have to uh, work harder in the States. Uh, there's less of a sharing mentality in the States we're discovering so far, and we have to understand a little why. Some of it has to do with the geography, that people in the States live further away from each other, and a lot of people live in places where they share the Wi-Fi nobody can connect to because the landscape of America is just more suburban, let's say. But some of the best places you have are like Tokyo or London and so on. But yeah, it's a similar effort in some way to uh, Wikipedia or to Craigslist. It's the collaboration, is the people who are installing these uh, with the help of, of telcos or without the help of telcos, and they're building a global wireless network. Got it. Our last boss at the table, uh, uh, explicitly described as such, I guess would be Dr. Gino Yu. Uh, Gino, you are Mr. Creativity. How to harness the creativity of people in useful and interesting ways. You want to tell us a little bit more about what you do? I'm at a university, um, but we have a commercial operation as well, too, focused on kind of entertainment and uh, kind of multimedia-related things. Um, on the creativity side, we're really interested in looking at uh, how people create the realities in their minds and how media impacts that. How they create the realities in their minds. Yeah. Can you, as we would say in academia, unpack that? <laughs> well, that's actually the class that we teach, which is uh, on recovering creativity, which is... I know the project has really had a roller coaster ride so far. It would be great to start getting into these community issues and including to what extent the bases you have to cover to make this thing a success involve 
cultivating in these kids excellence, engagement, and ethical. Well, very briefly, the, the, the kids are the least of problems. Uh, it's, uh, it's in fact getting to them. Uh, I, d I don't want introduction to give a speech about it, but this does go back to 1968, some very early work in, in sort of how children learn. And for the subsequent over 30 years uh, of work, Howard's work, Seymour Papert's work, others who contributed, it became very clear that there is a distinct difference between learning that happens through teaching, whether that's somebody talking like me right now or reading a book, and learning that happens by doing, that by actual, so that the first five years of our life, we, we learn things by interacting with the world and interacting with people and so on. And the question that has persisted for a long time is could you make that kind of learning more seamless and sort of more continuous and clearly uh, enabling children, particularly uh, very poor and remote children, uh, to have that kind of experience or you know, to leverage themselves is, is a very major issue. And so we set out three years ago to do one laptop per child um, and the uh, Logo is a little X with an O on it, which is a little image of a child, which of course then became the name of the uh, laptop. The millionth laptop will go out in December, so uh, even though there has been some uphill battle, uh, the million is, is smaller than I would have hoped by now, but it's still a very big number. And in fact, in Uruguay, about a month ago, the president of Uruguay handed out the 100,000th laptop to a six year old child. So there are some countries, Rwanda's one, uh, Mongolia's one, uh, Palestine, Lebanon will be, I believe, uh, Peru, Uruguay, um, where it is actually really take, getting traction, and, and that's very gratifying. So I gather these boxes have what might have some textbooks on them, some other links, some stuff that even if you're not on a network, the thing is useful, and then ways of being able to get onto a network either with other nearby boxes or if you arrive at your local school, the school maybe has a larger bandwidth connection and then you can get on. To what extent do you think is a successful deployment of these boxes dependent on their users or maybe the teachers who are the intermediaries having some sense of citizenship? This is a word we've heard a couple times during the introductions. Is that is it possible just to get absorbed in one of these boxes and irrespective of how you think of yourself as a member of a community, you have fun with it, or...? The, the, the boxes, as you keep calling them, is almost a little pejorative tone of the word box. I, but, not uh, intended. I, uh, I, know, I know. What's the preferred word? Uh, well, for now, let's call them laptops. Um, laptops. It's, it's, uh, oh, it's so their connection. I know, I know. Uh, they, they have been designed specifically to be collaborative. In fact, one of them alone is not very useful. They are, they are uh, distributed in groups because the group is very important. In fact, we just sent one to Mark where, you know, in fact, I think we sent you two, so you'd have a small group at least uh, of two because they collaborate with their neighboring laptops, which in turn with the neighboring ones and make a, a mesh. And that's really very important because one of the most, it's a key idea in learning is that you do it collaboratively. And uh, that's, in some sense, being a citizen or at least part of a group. Between ages of 6 and 12, citizenry may be really limited to sort of your immediate peer group. And the peer-to-peer -peer stuff is very important. It doesn't go just to an access point to the Internet and back again and to the that you really do the peer-to-peer -peer stuff. It's absolutely right. Yes, Martin. No, I just wanted to say that, uh, well, first thanks, Nicholas, <coughs> for sending them to me. And I, I was playing with these with laptops, and, and I think they're, they're very, very different experience from what we are used to when we think of a laptop, and I recommend people uh, just to you know, try one, because the concept of peer-to-peer -peer learning, I think it is very important, it is, and it's something that is very unexploited at all levels of education, that is, that there's a lot to learn from your peers, your other students, rather than uh, you know, these broadcasting uh, teaching methods of professors, and I don't mean to say, Jonathan, that you're one of those, but there were... I didn't think <laughs> you said that. <laughs> that. That you just, you know, speak and other people... And, and uh, when I, I also teach at the university in, in Madrid, Instituto de Empresa, 
and I have worked a lot on this concept, especially at a graduate level, of students uh, not only teaching each other but grading each other. Uh, I, I think that that brought down to the laptop, it's pretty fascinating what the one laptop for a child can do. Nicholas, would it be fair to ask, as we spend well, just one more beat on XO, of the problems you've wrestled with, including not just the logistical, uh, more pragmatic or political problems of, uh, of the project, maybe the more deeper conceptual ones, uh, is there any that would be of interest to you to put out to this group, interesting people at this table, surrounding the table, that's still sort of unresolved in your mind that relate to success of the project or the community aspect of it? You know, when, when uh, we started the project, we called it the $100 laptop, and uh, we always said that was a target. Then we got criticized in the press for not hitting the target, and uh, that's okay, because we hit whatever it was, 188, it'll come down pretty quickly, but the, the point is, we made a mistake. It shouldn't be the $100 laptop. It should be the $0 laptop. And so all of our effort now is to make it zero. And we think we know how to make a couple of hundred thousand a month at zero. And so our change is, is, is really that. And the way you make it zero isn't that you magically have materials that cost nothing and labor that cost nothing. It's that you get the price down to whatever we get it to. Let's pretend it's 150. Um, and then you get people like people in this room, people in Manhattan, to pay $300 for one of these things. And so the Give One, Get One program we ran last year, which in the space of a couple of weeks generated 150,000 laptops. So when you do that, you suddenly generate a momentum, and we're starting it again on November 17th. You create a momentum where people are doing it, like buying a bottle of water but paying extra because it's going to pay for uh, water purification in Africa. And that's, I think, the real model for the future to get it down to the zero dollar laptop for the recipient NGO or, or nation and, and that's where we're headed and I think that's a, a very important difference, a very important change for us to make uh, in the next few system. It can be shared with everybody else. On the other hand, I suppose there are fears as simple as someone will dispossess a kid of a laptop and you can try to work around that by making the keys so small that only a child's fingers would want to use them. But I got it as a kill switch so that a laptop that has slipped its lead can be simply disabled the way LoJack might with a car. And there are other ways in which the central server can try to control or monitor the laptops. How have you struck that balance of freedom and control? Um, you know, the com a common question is, you know, these machines are going to be stolen, they're going to appear on the gray market, and so on and so forth. Um, we've had am almost no incidents of that, you know, and, and the numbers are getting big enough to say that there's, you know, maybe there's a message there. And uh, the message is, I think, that yes, there's all sorts of technology, and yes, we can remotely kill a machine and turn it into a brick, and we can do these things, but um, and if, you know, you, you look at all of that technology in there, that's not like really what, what counts. What counts is, is that even the worst people in the world, the people who you think uh, are you know, very low moral value, really want education for their kids, their own kids and their community. And even in some of the roughest communities, they, you know, they, they really protect the kids. And there's a little bit of sort of don't pee on your own doorstep, but there's also you know, a, a, a community protection that, that happens. And uh, in one case where a child's laptop was stolen, the other people were so outraged when they found it and so on. Trust me, that person would touch another laptop again. And, and so the community really helps. And it's a little bit uh, very much like the Wikipedia, the community kind of. And by that, you mean the physical, local community of people yep. around these machines. That's absolutely. Would it be sensible uh, if one laptops per child when surfing the internet at large, if they naturally identified themselves as such to websites, the way that if I'm surfing with an iPhone, magically websites can know it's an iPhone and shrink the screen accordingly. Would that be a community device or should they just be another denizen as far as surfing would be concerned? 
Well, there are probably two sides to that question. In general, you should probably just be another netizen, but the other side of the answer is, is that you have six to 12 year olds, so you have a very special kind of concern about pornography and about things that, yeah. where you do you do uh, worry about that, and, and knowing that it's, it's an XO helps a great deal. Is there any advice that anybody around the table has been itching to offer Nicholas for which operating in the public would be illuminating to all of us? I have a, more of a question for uh -huh. advice, and, and maybe I need to um, get a couple of these machines and play with them myself. <laughs> Um, when I have played with one, it's always been for five or ten minutes at a conference. I run into some of these people, and the interface seems very different. Um, and what I wonder, and I understand there's some educational reasons for that. I wonder. Uh, my daughter uses um, her laptop, which is a, a Mac, and she uses it just like anybody else in the room. And she's learned how to do all kinds of interesting things. Um, but why not have a more traditional interface um, so that the, the children are getting a, a little bit more maybe direct training on computer skills that they'll need, um, well, in a few years anyway? And that's just a question. Um, <coughs> there, there are two, there are, again, two sides to the, to the answer. One, one is, is we made a mistake not to have a traditional interface as an upfront option. And we're changing that, and you will see uh, not only the option to have Windows in the dual boot machine, which has gotten a lot of press, and I've gotten a lot of heat about from the open source community, <laughs> but a dual boot machine is really the right way to go. Uh, Apple's laptop became a success because of their dual boot. All the IT directors of this country couldn't buy Macs for their employees, but now that it has Windows on it, they can buy it, even if people don't do it. So having that option is important, but also a Linux desktop is very important, mm -hmm. and we'll have that option uh, in time for November's uh, launch. So on that side, we agree with you. On the other side, though, it's not so much to be trained. It's not so much to be trained on a familiar desktop so you can use Office, uh, Open Office, or Office of the it's, we, we felt it was quite important to have something that was more collaborative, more, so what you really saw was a community and not so much a suite of applications like PowerPoint, Excel, and Word. In fact, if you teach a six-year-old PowerPoint, Excel, or Word, I think that's criminal. Okay, I just think it's a criminal offense because the children don't need to be little office workers. And when I criticize the commercial interests commercial country companies now that that have low cost laptops. I think of sort of sixteenth century paintings where the painters painted children as diminutive adults. And it was only later that people started to paint children as children. And the same things happen. I think that a lot of the commercial interests see children as diminutive adults and the children will use sort of in a diminutive form the programs we use, and so they'll take a laptop and they make a diminutive version of the laptop. Ours isn't a diminutive version of a laptop. It is a bottoms-up concept that has to do with young children and how they learn, how they collaborate. And I think that's a very important difference, and it's one we just have to keep in mind. So, yes, you need what you said, especially if you're going to do give one, get one, and you're going to get one, you want to get one you can use, which wasn't the case last time. But from the children's point of view, you really have to look at collaboration and as part of learning. It's a very different platform. Pradeep. Yes. I've been thinking about this, and I wanted to change.